for a uh, typical New England fall day. Um, we just had a, a, a very interesting uh, ITC colloquium uh, on um, AGV stars and all subject, um, but with new insights. Um, and uh, today we'll hear first uh, from our own uh, Michelle Kampaka. Uh, who will tell us about uh, deep learning, uh, a very timely subject uh, in the context of cosmological constraints for galaxy redshift surveys. Uh, and then uh, we'll hear from Niharika uh, Sraban uh, from Purdue. Uh, where is Niharika? Uh, over there. Uh, and uh, she will tell us about uh, real-time value-driven data augmentation in the era of LSSP. So both of our first talks are, are related to data analysis, which is a future frontier, very important. Uh, and then we'll hear from a, a familiar person that uh, many years ago used to be uh, a student here, Zoltan Hyman, who is now a professor yes, at uh, Columbia University, and uh, he's speaking uh, later today. Uh, and he will talk about uh, making a supermassive star by stellar bombardment. A very interesting subject. And finally, we'll hear from Helen Price, uh, again a local person. Where is Helen? Helen? Over there. Um, and she will talk about chemistry along with Christian streams in protoplanetary disks. Michelle. Thank you very much, Ali. So today I want to talk to you about a hybrid deep learning approach for cosmological constraints from galaxy catalogs. And when I say hybrid, what I mean here is that we're going to join physics with machine learning. So let's start with an image of the cosmic web. So this is a slice through an n-body simulation um, showing sort of the beautiful cosmic web of structure. We've got the overdense halos, filaments, underdense voids. Um, and it turns out that there's a lot of cosmological information in this cosmic web, provided you know how and where to look. The spatial distribution and clustering of galaxies, typically done through the power spectrum, is one thing that holds a lot of cosmological information. The cosmic shear holds cosmological information, baryon acoustic oscillations, and the abundance of galaxy clusters are all pieces of information from this large scale structure that are rich in cosmological information for constraining cosmological models. Today we're going to look at the spatial distribution and clustering of galaxies, but we're going to remove that caveat that it has to be done through the power spectrum. For this work, I'm using the Abacus Cosmos suite of simulations. So there are 40 training simulations that vary in six cosmological parameters. Uh, on the left-hand side, what I'm showing you here is the black points are those simulations in that parameter space. I'm going to divide it up into very small mock observations, about 1 20th of the gigaparsec cubed box. I'll reuse pieces, so I've got 3,200 mock observations. 80% of them will train my machine learning model, and I'll, remain, I'll, I'll set aside 20% for validating the model. Now, I said I was going to do this with 3D galaxy catalogs, and an n-body simulation will give you halo catalogs. So those halos are populated with galaxies according to a generalized uh, halo occupation distribution, or HOD. And to really kind of muck things up, um, this is a really flexible HOD with six parameters to capture a range of different galaxy formation models. Okay, so at this point in time, I want you to take away three things. Number one, Large-scale structure carries cosmological information. Number two, um, I'm using entirely simulations for this project, so this is a pilot program. Um, and number three, I've done what I can to really sort of muck up the data. Six different cosmological parameters varied, six HOD parameters varied, because of course the universe is not going to tell us which of those has been selected. So we want to really just present a, a wide buffet of options. So a typical approach here is going to summarize this 3D catalog with the power spectrum, showing the power spectrum, the galaxy power spectrum, um, for five of those cosmologies. And I want to emphasize at this point that these are really small um, mock observations. 
And so what you're seeing here is a lot of noise in those power spectra. Um, even from, for wildly disparate cosmologies, um, there's a lot of overlap. And so for small mock observations, um, the power spectrum is, is at a bit of a disadvantage. Just want to put that up front. Why do I think machine learning can possibly work here? Um, that is because the galaxy spectrum, I'm sorry, the power spectrum, does not tell the whole story. So there are other stats that are rich in complementary cosmological information. For example, the three-point correlation function, redshift space power spectrum, counts in cylinders are, are just a few of, of other test stats that one can use to complement the power spectrum. And so the question now is, can we use physics plus machine learning to improve constraints on cosmological parameters? Um, and can a deep machine learning method find meaningful patterns, and, and I mean kind of beyond the power spectrum, to extract information to correlate with cosmology? So for this, I'm going to use a convolutional neural network. Here I'm showing a vanilla 2D CNN. These are typically used for image recognition. Um, what they do is they start with an input image, and they're going to learn um, uh, with the goal of, of predicting a label at the output, and they're going to learn a system of, of filters to extract features. What I mean by features here is textures and edges and shapes. They're going to extract those features from the image. Then they're going to learn a system of weights and biases to turn those features into an output label or into, into an answer. I'm not using a vanilla 2D CNN. I'm extending to three dimensions. So for this 3D CNN, um, you're using now a, a data cube instead of just an image. I'm going to assess two different, um, two different neural networks here. The first one is a power spectrum-based neural network. So for this, the input's just going to be the binned power spectrum. So I've taken that 3D information of the galaxies. I've written down a summary statistic. And I'm going to process it through the fully connected network to predict two cosmological parameters. Then for the hybrid approach, I will connect both the thing that I know contains physical information, but I'll also hand in the unpreprocessed three-dimensional data cube and allow that CNN to look for patterns that maybe I haven't been able to write down. So those are the two that we're going to look at. Let's see how they do. OK, here what I'm showing is true and predicted omega matter for the power spectrum only. And you can see that the results are noisy and bias low. The hybrid CNN, which is free to find its own patterns, um, tends to get them more right. For sigma 8, we have a slightly different story. Um, for sigma 8, again, true on the x-axis, predicted on the y. Um, lots of scatter for the power spectrum alone. But when the CNN is allowed to find those patterns, it really tightens it up. <coughs> Two places you should be suspicious here. Okay, let's proceed with caution. Number one, the network was trained to recognize these particular cosmologies. I just showed you results from my validation set. So will it interpolate to cosmologies it's never seen before, or has it somehow memorized a set of possible answers? Number two, the net, and this, this is a place where we really have to proceed with caution, the network was trained on matched phase simulations. And so is it just memorizing structure that correlates across those sims? Okay. To assess these, I'm going to turn to um, some complementary simulations uh, at the Planck cosmology, which are shown, he shown here by the, the blue uh, square. 20, there's a 20 simulation suite here with unique initial conditions, previously unseen cosmology, previously unseen um, HOD. 1,600 mock observations. So this is a more realistic test of how this network might perform when handed the real universe. And the results are very exciting. So what I'm showing here is omega matter and sigma 8. The white star is the truth. Um, this green dotted is power spectrum only, which you can see is highly influenced by the degeneracy of the simulations. Um, the hybrid CNN finds patterns in that data that, that were not summarized simply by the power spectrum in order to not only make predictions that are closer to the truth, 
but also really tighten up the error bars um, in Sigma 8. All right, at this point in time, I think you probably all have a pressing question. And that question is, where is the information coming from? If I can't find it in the power spectrum, where is it? And to answer that question, I'm actually gonna talk about my Halloween costume. Okay, so I am wearing a Halloween costume today, um, but I think this might not be the right demographics to be able to fully appreciate my costume. Um, are there any self-driving cars or robots in the room? Okay, none. <laughs> um, I'm dressed up today as a toaster. Let, let me state it a little more um, carefully. I'm dressed up today in a way that an image recognition algorithm would classify me with high probability as being a toaster. And it's because I'm wearing an adversarial patch. Um, so adversarial attacks are a way of interpreting and understanding deep neural networks. Images live in this kind of complex, high dimensional space and they sparsely populate it. And a lot of the images in that space don't actually make sense to our brains and to our eyes. This is, according to a CNN, a quintessential toaster. It is the most toaster thing that can be. And so if you put this patch in an image with a, if you have a banana and you classify it, you will get the right answer. But if you put the patch in the image with the banana, you will suddenly classify this as being high probability a toaster. Very, very low probability as actually containing a banana. Um, so inter to interpret these methods, I can tell you right now that they certainly contain information. I can't tell you right now what that information is, but the way I will tell you, hopefully the next time I stand up here, is by using an adversarial attack. Okay. Um, I think you all know that I used to be a middle school teacher. And what do middle school teachers do well? Stickers. So <laughs> if anyone would like their own adversarial patch, um, I will pass these out. I'll just go ahead and grab one and, and pass them down. All right, I've got some for the 50 yard line as well. Um, so what I've shown today is, is this hybrid CNN um, can be used to put constraints on sigma eight and omega matter. Even with a small volume, it finds patterns that do really well in spite of all the complicating factors that I was able to throw at it. Thank you. We got 50 yard line adversarial patches. There we go. <laughs> yes. Obviously, the the one thing that the power spectrum doesn't capture is the space. You can capture the screen. That's right. The amplitude of the perturbations, but what's missing in the Fourier components is the phase, which for linear perturbations is not carrying any information, but once you become more linear, once the structure becomes more linear, then that's where the X ray information is. It's in the phase correlations of the structure. But uh, what I really want to ask you is, uh, do you believe that, uh, that machine learning and CNNs will uh, come to the rescue of cosmology or uh, we will use self-driving cars? That's a good question. Um, so I think you know that my policy on this is that I find it very unsatisfying um, to build a black box, to feed in observations, and to get an answer back out at the end. Um, so the way that I hope to treat this particular tool um, is as a very creative lab assistant who um, has sort of infinite freedom to look for patterns in data. And now the question I want to ask is, kind of where did those patterns come from? Um, I don't see machine learning replacing us. Um, I find it unsatisfying to even imagine a world where machine learning replaces the people in this room. Um, but it certainly can give us a handle on trying to figure out what sort of extra information can we extract and point us in directions to do that. Yeah. So I don't expect it to do well at the cosmology, at cosmologies near the edge. Um, it, machine learning techniques tend to interpolate much better than they extrapolate. And so to really set this loose on the universe, 
Um, what I'd love is cosmologies that extend even well beyond. Um, I will say that I looked at how these methods, what sort of the diversity of predictions for these methods, even at the outskirts and around the edges, um, and it does do better toward the middle. That being said, I want, I want to assure you that it does well not just at the very center, which is the data point that I happen to have these 20 complementary test, test sets for, um, but, but in a range around it. Yeah. So um, one hand waving thing about the cosmic web that people point out is that every cluster has three streams of stuff going into it. Right. And is, is that the sort of thing that you think maybe that the, the that you're finding here, that you're somehow encoding? So um, I, I've heard it said that if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem tends to look like a nail. Um, and I am a cluster girl through and through. And so uh, the first, you know, cluster stats are my, are my hammer, and I'm, I'm going looking for the nail. I wouldn't be surprised if I was finding that it was identifying these sort of massive peaks in the structure. Um, but at this point in time, I really just can't say. I can't say with certainty what it's seeing. Yeah. Um, if you validate on a galaxy formation model that you did not train on, do you bias the cosmology that you infer? That's a good question. I have not looked specifically um, HOD to HOD to see like if they if one particular HOD clumps up in one direction and one clumps in another I wouldn't be surprised if they did um, so I'm not sure yeah I don't know the answer to that question Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Niharika Shravan. Uh, I'm a C.L. Johnson Fellow uh, in Dan Willis Havlevik's Time Domain Astrophysics Group mm -hmm. at Purdue University. Um, so LSSD is expected to be transformative for many types of science questions. If you compare this to the current largest surveys operational, you will find that we're going to have an order of magnitude leg up uh, by 2022 in terms of data. This is exciting, however for, however, for transients, this sort of poses a challenge. Up here, I'm sort of showing a collection of light curves that were analyzed uh, for stripped envelope supernovae in order to constrain the physics of the light curves. So look at that for a second, and then look at these. So this is what you expect to get from LSST, and that is because 90% of LSST's time is going to be spent on the wide, fast, deep survey, in which is going to only repeat a photo photometry about three days or so. This is not set in stone, but uh, that's what is expected to be. It is unclear as to what kinds of science you can do to derive physics out of this. So take that, and then there's a second challenge. On a given night, LSST will discover 2,000 of these every single day. So if you were to sort of like sit and try to like do it by hand, that'll be prohibitive. So the question in everybody's mind is, okay, I think I know that what I will get won't be sufficient in many cases. I'll have to do something extra. But how do I know when I should do that? How do I know that at that point an intervention would be valuable? So let's run the following thought experiment, okay? This is the light curve you're going to get. And you have a model in mind. It was sufficiently complicated. And you went ahead and fit it anyway, because we are all ambitious. And we get bad results. Okay. But let's roll back the time a little bit here. We go back in time, the event is happening, and some sort of like a smart entity 
or like like an oracle or somebody could tell you, hey, take data here. And you did. You would end up with constraints that become better just because of that extra data point. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, think about it as a different challenge, for example. The same, photo, uh, same light curves. People are interested in classification. This is sparse. And typically, you'll get a classification with some sort of a confidence. So this one is a class 2 with some confidence. I'm just, these are the numbers. But then, for instance, the same oracle could intervene and be like, hey, take spectra here. And you could, in turn, uh, confirm the class spectroscopically, which is a gold standard. So that would be great. If this was a 1A, you could wait until late stages, and the oracle could also tell you, hey, take spectra. And maybe you'll find more 1A CSMs. So this oracle I keep speaking of has the following challenge. On the night in LSST, it'll receive thousands, actually about 100,000 or so of these. Um, and its challenge is to characterize each and every one of them and sort them according to when follow-up would be useful to constrain your science of interest. So if this was your theoretical model, you sort it according to when additional photometry or any additional follow-up would be valuable for your science case. So let me formalize this a little bit. An oracle is any system that autonomously strategizes and coordinates follow-up in real time to optimally augment a science stream, uh, given your scientific objective. So I'm sure you're wondering why I'm <laughs> talking about all of this. So last year at Purdue, uh, we've been spending time developing Refit, or the recommender engine for intelligent transient tracking. Uh, this is a prototype of an oracle. Uh, so here we have, uh, so sort of this is the schema of the Refit system. Uh, at the top level, you're ingesting survey data and any broker input that gives you additional information about the event, classification, redshift, or any such thing. And you, you pass it through the internals, any AI pieces in it. And then what the job of the system is to look at all of them, prioritize them, and come up with a strategy based on the science objective it's given for telling you when to take data. It then makes recommendations for follow-up and broadcasts it out to observing agents that are subscribing to the system to receive alerts and respond to our requests. And the goal is to eventually have that value added extra data point uh, that can make better sense of the event. So for instance, uh, at the prototype level, the system is working for core collapse supernovae expected from um, uh, LSST given the plastic data set. Uh, for the experts in the audience, uh, we use a convolutional autoencoder to match any incoming event to library events. Uh, and there are two metrics for strategy. There's a data-driven metric and a science-driven metric, and I'll talk about them in the next slide. So here is an example of how Refit learns. So this is this one event. It's from the deep drilling field survey. And uh, the portion in the white region is what Refit sees. And the portion in the gray region is what it projects. And these are six different filters. And it, uh, as time goes on, the prediction sort of changes. So you start off with a high uncertainty, and it sort of jumps around a little bit, by the, but by the end of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, range of uh, interest, uh, you end up becoming better at constraining. So here's what we did. We simulated refit for a given LSST night. So this is a subset of the question of asking, uh, what can refit a system like uh, refit can tell you about when to take data? We gave it about 32,000 events uh, within a window, predefined window of action from the plastic data set. And uh, so th uh, the main panel here is sort of uh, refits uh, um, sort of prioritization. So this is none of these are recommendations. This is just prioritized based on prediction confidence. So this is, for instance, number one ranked on that night, given 32,000 events, and all the way down to 34. And obviously, once again, anything is white, in white was what was seen. Uh, in uh, gray was what was predicted. And behind, you can see photometric points that tell you how refit was doing, because we actually have the, the known values, right? So this is a, a testing. Um, in, in the machine learning lingo, this is testing. Uh, so, so what happens is the, uh, so it, uh, this is a set of priorities. And this translates to a follow-up recommendation for that night. And for this uh, uh, iteration, we use the data-driven metric, which uh, I can discuss in further detail if anybody is interested, but essentially it tries to fill in gaps in the, uh, in the training, uh, in the training uh, phase space. So for instance here, this is an early event light curve, and uh, so the first recommendation is to obtain follow-up, say for instance, in the U-band at that event, and it tells you ex 
you know, sort of what do you expect to see from that event. And the goal is eventually, as you start responding to refit, you start filling up the, uh, the, tra uh, the uh, training phase space so that you need that data lesser and lesser in the future. Uh, so this is, uh, is uh, data-driven, as I said. But eventually, uh, we want to, we, uh, with the recognition that eventually any of this data will be interpreted with scientific models that you guys already have. So if you, wouldn't it be nice that eventually I could ask whether this particular extra data point would be usefully constraining your scientific model that a light curve model is already existing. So for this, we resort to something called uh, a de-optimality in optimal experiment designs that essentially translates the utility of me making a measurement such that you improve constraints on the theoretical, uh, uh, theoretical parameters that describes your models. So it will be ranked according to which epoch and which observation will improve constraints so that you maximize the Shannon information about your uh, theoretical model parameters. Okay. So I wanted to conclude by saying a few things. So in the era of LSST, we'll have the following challenge. There'll be too many things to go after, and there's going to be high cost for collecting the data. Every time a situation like this comes in, we have to ask ourselves, what's the value of obtaining follow-up? And any follow-up, any good follow-up strategy should take that into account. This is with the recognition that not all data are equally valuable for constraining science, so you have to be smart about it. Systems like refit, oracles, are uh, geared towards maximizing the scientific potential of surveys. So you intervene, take critical data as and when necessary. You don't interfere with survey schedules. Uh, you also optimally tap into the global network of follow-up resources, either in photometry or we can have uh, multi-wavelength, even multi-messenger feedback that can optimally augment uh, what we want to know, given our, our objectives. We reduce downtime and bias in data collections. Humans looking at the data stream will need to sleep and uh, will, will have biases. Systems like this have the potential of removing that. And finally, you have flexibility. So you give it your scientific objective, and it will tell you what you need to do to better constrain that science. Yes, that is correct. Is it, is it possible to design uh, an oracle that will basically tell us, look, this is really a new, this is really strange, and we have to monitor it much more often, so it's something that we've never seen before? Ashley, uh, she is, uh, and Michelle, uh, they're looking at some of these questions. I think uh, the difficulty with uh, using uh, machine learning to go after things that you don't know about is uh, the following thing. So you will, every now and then, know that something weird is happening. The question is, should you do something about it? Uh, and the second question is, is something weird happening because your model was wrong, or is this something genuinely interesting happening? And I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, the reason I'm approaching it like this is because I'm, uh, I was interested in studying core collapse supernovae, and I was motivated by looking at LSST. But what, I, what demotivated me was some of these light curves. And eventually, I want to constrain science better. and. Um, I think that, you know, uh, coming in, so there's this piece, yes, this is all known stuff that we want to do, but it's better than doing nothing at all. And, and any, any science program needs to have a balance of, all, of both goals eventually. So I'm not saying take all your resources and spend it on this, but uh, this is one way of doing that. Yeah, so I was uh, among those who helped to create this data set. The yeah. question we all had in mind is how well do you do with just the data set? You know, with the idea being that in the future, no matter how much follow-up time we have on how many instruments, mm -hmm. many of the interesting things simply won't be selected mm -hmm. for follow-up. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, just even just for the class that you're interested in, the, in the core collapse supernovae, mm -hmm. did you feel that you were able to achieve something interesting, that you were able to identify enough events just from the data set without follow-up? Or did you always have to go back and see what the modelers had actually done? So that's an interesting question. I never. So reason I. So 
I would say the simple answer to that question would be we weren't looking for anything interesting. The whole goal of this was to make predictions, to prioritize follow-up when I don't understand things well, given the fact that I want to know something X, for instance. I want to in decrease my uncertainty window, or I want to relate it to a scientific model. So. I haven't looked is the question is the answer to that question. But if you can you and I can discuss later if that would be something of interest. But mm -hmm. I haven't sure. if Stu, yeah. I haven't tried. Thank you. Any other questions? No, So, uh, well, thank you uh, for, for inviting me to the lunch. Uh, I have to say uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be back here every time I come. My thesis defense was a long time ago here, and this, I feel like this lunch keeps growing and growing. I didn't actually realize it's going to be like a conference talk. <laughs> I thought we were just having lunch. So it's very nice to see that. Uh, so uh, I want to tell you about uh, one of the ways we can make big black holes, of course, the title said supermassive stars, but uh, these stars collapse into black holes. So our goal here is to explain how very massive black holes might have formed in the early universe. This is a paper we recently submitted with uh, Hiromichi Tagawa and Ben Sekocic, who was also here and also worked with Avi, actually. So uh, uh, the observational motivation of this subject is also about 20 years old. I have here compiled a sample of the highest redshift known quasars, and I plotted the redshifts. There are 204 dots in this plot, which was a, quite a work to compile. But, uh, uh, and these are basically the brightnesses of these quasars converted to a mass, assuming that they have a constant Eddington ratio. And uh, the, the conclusion from this plot is that they're very massive black holes very early on. Uh, and these two curves here show you what mass you would have for a black hole, which was formed at redshift 35 from an early star, which left behind a 10 or 100 solar mass. So 10 solar mass or 100 solar mass black hole, which grew continuously at the so-called Eddington rate, when the luminosity is always matching the Eddington luminosity. And so we actually pointed out uh, in a paper with Avi uh, 18 years ago that this is an interestingly tight uh, situation where the black holes which appear very early have to grow all the time at this Eddington rate, or even faster to get to these large masses so early. So that's the motivation. Uh, and this triggered many, many, many papers since the la last 18 years on how more massive black holes m might have arisen more rapidly in the early universe. Early universe meaning uh, well beyond redshift of six. So these are all summarized in this annual reviews article, which I was going to summarize here, but it won't take too long. So I'm basically going to talk about one, one particular new, new, new part of this review. But let me just give you a little bit more background. So there are basically three ideas how you might get massive black holes very quickly in the early universe. One is that you grow continuously from a stellar remnant black hole. Uh, in this case, the pl problem is uh, that you have to go continuously at this Eddington limit. And these black holes are born in very, very tiny galaxies where the escape speeds are very small. So gas can be ejected, the black holes can be ejected uh, from these halos. So that's generally difficult. A more, uh, uh, another idea, but it's not imp completely impossible. The other idea uh, is uh, to have much more rapid infall of gas into early proto-galaxies. Uh, and it's sometimes people call this the so-called direct collapse into a black hole. Uh, or alternatively, one of these stellar mass black holes can accrete very rapidly at much, rates much, much higher than the Eddington limit. And this is also possible. Uh, there are special conditions needed to arrange this. But the way this works is actually the physics I'm going to use here, uh, also for the model I'll talk about. And it's, it's essentially the formation of a supermassive star. So what I, and actually the key concept here is very simple. 
protostars, stars form by forming first a protostellar core, which is accreting from in our, in our ISM from some cold molecular cloud, and it's piling on gas. So this, this graph here shows uh, the mass of the protostellar core, or becoming a star, and this is the radius of the protostar, and this black curve here would show a uh, uh, normal POP3 star, but also roughly what happens in a normal massive star. You start accreting gas, so these are one-dimensional stellar evolution models, protostellar evolution models. The only parameter that's changed is the accretion rate. So this bottom curve has an accretion rate of 10 minus 3 solar mass a year. That's already quite a bit higher than what we have in, in the Milky Way ISM. But this star is growing, it's increasing its radius, and then here it contracts to the main sequence. So that's the after that happens after the so-called Kelvin Helmholtz time, when the binding energy is radiated away and you contract on the main sequence. And then the star suddenly becomes uh, uh, very hot. The effective temperature is in such that ten, tens of thousands of degrees, so it emits ultraviolet and prevents further growth by photoheating and evaporating the gas uh, uh, near it. And so that's what's supposed to terminate the growth on this main sequence and set the normal maximum mass of massive stars of order tens of or maybe hundred solar masses. So the interesting physics, hap physics happens if you crank up the accretion rate, so this is the theory world where you t play with the accretion rate, if you crank it up above this critical rate of about 0.1 solar mass a year, then a very simple thing happens. This protostar is actually piling an envelope faster than it can contract, and it is never able to contract. So it's never becoming uh, uh, hot. Uh, the effective temperature remains in the such that it radiates only infrared. So it's more like a red giant. And there's no particular reason to terminate its growth by feedback from radiation. So it just keeps growing, growing, growing. The mass is here reached 10 to the 5 solar mass, at which point uh, general relativistic instability is uh, believed to produce a black hole uh, inside out. The core collapses, makes the black hole. So that's very interesting. You have to arrange these large accretion rates. Just uh, a very rough cartoon description is that the accretion rate in a self gallivating bowl of gas, which is collapsing at some fixed temperature or sound speed, is just sound speed cubed over G. So in a molecular cloud in the Milky Way, this number is maybe 10 minus 5 or 6 solar mass a year. Uh, if the temperature goes from 10 Kelvin uh, to more like 300 Kelvin, which can be reached in proto-galaxies by molecular hydrogen cooling, it's 10 minus 3. If you remain very hot, if this ca gas cloud has no molecules, no metals, just Lyman alpha radiation, it will remain very hot, 10 to the 4 Kelvin. This accretion rate can be very large. And then we expect this to happen. So the, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, <coughs> it actually has been demonstrated in 3D simulations that such warm gas, uh, this is a particular 3D simulation where uh, it's an AMR simulation, so it follows the cosmological collapse of a gas in a 10 to the 7 or 8 solar mass halo, which has no metals or molecular hydrogen, so it does this warm collapse from kiloparsec down to 10 AU scale, and there's no, no fragmentation, and the core here does accrete these rapid rates. So we expect a supermassive star. The catch is that you need to have no hydrogen molecules, no metals, and that's a bit difficult uh, in such relatively massive halos because to get to these temperatures, the halo has to be much larger than we expect the first, very first generation. So then com coming to my own uh, recent work is this idea that uh, if you have some metals, then the previous picture is modified. Gas still collapses quite rapidly to high density, but then it fragments because it starts cooling by the metals and it fragments. And if the metallicity is very low, what we expect is a very dense cluster of stars forming uh, in this object, and they can undergo core collapse, uh, just like uh, nor this has been discussed in other contexts, like people try to form black holes in globular clusters, my mass segregation and core collapse. So that's expected to happen, but it can only give you a relatively so-called intermediate mass black hole because a small fraction of this cluster will collect in the middle and form a black hole at the end. So what we proposed in this new paper, maybe I'll skip this one slide, is that uh, actually it may be even more interesting than this because uh, these 
physics I described, which doesn't allow stars to contract, will cause another kind of runaway uh, growth of a massive star in the center. And so that is why I call this stellar bombardment. So here the picture is, this is, so this is a one-dimensional n-body simulation. That's a fancy name for a toy model we concocted, which, which describes this system, which has a dark matter halo, spherically symmetric, ten, ten, a few times 10 to the 7 solar masses. It has gas in it, which is uh, remaining isothermal initially. Uh, and then the, uh, there's protostars which are forming in a spherical symmetric way, distributed spherically symmetrically, and there's a central star. And then we allow various processes. Stars can form. Stars are migrating inward towards the center due to dynamical friction on both stars and gas. Stars can collide. That's the key point. Uh, the protostars also grow by accretion. And if one of the star contracts, it starts emitting UV and heat the gas, and the process can stop because the gas is ejected. So that's the, that's the thing we're describing. And the new interesting result is that if the cluster here is very dense, which we actually do expect in this very low metallicity regime in an early protogalaxy, uh, the density above 10 to the 8 solar mass per cubic parsec, uh, then what happens is the central star keeps growing uh, due to merging with other stars and is never contracting on the main sequence. And it's starting to bloat. There is a feedback here because as it's increasing its radius, it's more easily colliding with other stars because it's larger. And so if it's lar larger, there's more mergers per unit time, so now it's growing more easily, so it never contracts. And so this can actually eat up most of the gas in the halo within uh, two million years before any star actually would settle on the main sequence. So, so that's the picture we came up with. Uh, it's essentially protostars are colliding more rapidly. There's never a time for the, the object to contract. And so this can actually give you relatively more massive black holes. And the conclusion is, I like to phrase this in terms of an IMF, black hole IMF. Black holes are forming uh, at stellar masses due to remnants of pop three stars or pop two stars in the early universe, or even now massive stars. Very massive black holes and intermediate mass black holes formed due to these other processes that I was describing. And in particular, this regime might be due to this collapse of a metal poor cluster of protostars. So that's it. Thanks. So yeah, I think actually both of those are interesting. Uh, I don't know which is better. The the uh, the Lisa. I just first of all the sensitivity of Lisa is, is is exactly what you want because it can detect mergers between ten to the four solar mass black holes at redshift ten, is the idea. So so in this model, uh, I, I would I'm pretty sure that the merger rates are different. Uh, uh, and these can discriminate, for example, if pop three stars grow to large black holes, then there will be all kinds of mass, the IMF or the mass spectrum of black holes in a given time will be continuous. Whereas if you form, uh, skip a stage of 10 to the 4, uh, because you have this rapid collapse of 10 to the 5 solar mass black holes, you're just missing the 10 to the 4 solar mass ones. So that's pretty basic. I think the other very interesting discriminator, going back to electromagnetic regime, actually good you asked me because I can mention uh, a project I'm involved in, which is actually the PI is here, Alexei Wittlin with Lynx. So Lynx also has a very nice sensitivity, detecting few times 10 to the 4 solar mass black holes at redshift 10. And this model, which I described, where these massive black holes are forming, are very weird actually, because there's no real galaxy uh, behind them. So this would be a way of an M sigma or an M black hole M star relation. They're born very large compared to their halos. 
And if you catch them in such a phase, for example, with links, you see the black hole and X-ray as the point source, and then you look with JWST, you cannot see any host, uh, then that's, that's also interesting, because if a 10 to the 5 solar mass black hole at redshift 10 grew more leisurely fashion from some smaller black holes, it should have a galaxy around it, which JWST should see. So that's uh, another way. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, you mentioned the, the instability that they would reach if they reach uh, very high masses. The original papers, at some point, stellar evolutionary people got very excited about modeling these stars. They always mentioned that rotation could yeah. support the star against this instability. Do you expect any rotation that would be the bombardment so isotropic that you don't expect any Yeah, so I think that's a very good question. And I'm not sure I have the 100% answer, but all I can, all I'm aware of is so Shibata and Shapiro did simulations in GR where, where it is the supermassive stars are actually rotating at the limit where mass is lost from the surface. And at that limit, uh, they still find that 70% of the total mass ends up in the black hole. So yeah, I've, I've, uh, there are claims that some of these might actually explode, uh, these supermassive stars, in a f similar to a gamma ray burst, but uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, this would be very long with gamma ray burst for two reasons. One, they come from high yeah. redshift. Yeah. And second, the, the mass of the black hole is large, so they could last for minutes. Other questions? Yes? Uh, it seems like hey. So, uh, so the, it is actually sensitive because if you have too much metals, so that, again, this is not ironclad, but the general thinking is the metallicity is higher, fragmentation occurs at lower density earlier on in the collapse, and then you don't get this. So it's very critical ingredient of this model to have the high density so that before the 10 to the 5 years before you contract, you hit, you're hit by another star. That only happens if these cores are really compact, forming in a really compact region. So if the metallicity is about 10 to the minus 4 or above, then it, this scenario may not work. Uh, that's the idea. Just to, first, when we got these large densities, I was very worried that this is a crazy idea. And I started looking for what is the densest stellar density we've seen in the universe. And it's actually not so crazy, because if you look at M32, uh, you can resolve the core of M32 to the point where its stellar density is 10 to the 7. So we're talking about maybe a one or two orders of magnitude higher, but on a small, smaller scale. So I'm not sure that's necessary. Since when do you restrict your imagination? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I realize it's dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> So, 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 uh, let me, th I mean, first, uh, uh, I, th I think that's possible. Uh, the globular cluster densities are much smaller than this. So, but I think it actually gives the right way that instead of forming this big black hole in the middle, you form a dense star, star cluster. Uh, and, uh, the, the, the densest globular cluster, I believe, is 10 to the 6 ish in the center. So yeah, maybe that's a failed version of this with the metal cities higher.
post. Oh. I really did test this before. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, hi, my name is Ellen Price, and today I'm just going to give a really short overview of some of the work I've been doing as part of my thesis here at Harvard. Uh, and my advisor is Karen Oberg, and I also work with Ilsa Cleves, who is a former ITC postdoc. Uh, so I'm just going to flash this up, and I don't want you to memorize it, but the idea here that I want you to take away is just that protoplanetary disks are really complex systems of gas and dust that surround a young star. So they have strong vertical and radial temperature gradients, which I'm showing on the right. Um, on the left, I'm showing some physical processes like grain growth and settling and turbulent transport, but what I really want to draw your attention to is accretion, because that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, this is a process where most of the disk material will spiral in towards the star and eventually fall onto the star. And uh, basically in my work, I've assumed that all these other processes that I just mentioned are negligible. Probably wrong, but you know. Uh, so why should you care about this? It's worth asking, and um, the idea that I want to give you is that intuitively, if material is spiraling in towards the star, then the composition of the material close to the star is going to be changing with time. Um, that hopefully you can just picture. But um, planets that form in this inner disk region could experience a range of environments as they form, as material sort of sweeps by them and falls onto the star. And so understanding the chemical evolution of the disk is important for understanding planet formation because it tells us what kind of planets can form in the terrestrial zone. Now, the method I'm going to describe, I'm going to go into a lot of detail, and again, you don't have to memorize it, but um, we wanted to develop a method that is simple enough to be computationally tractable. Uh, you can run this on, on a desktop, but we also wanted something that was complex enough to tell us something interesting, and so it's, it's a delicate balance, right? And the method I'm going to present here is basically local, and uh, it is relatively fast compared to trying to simulate a global disk, uh, so simulating all radii uh, over time. Um, there are other models that try to solve everything at once. We're sort of moving away from that approach and instead doing this, this more local thing. So big scary equation. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is the nonlinear diffusion equation for the surface density of a disk. Surface density is just defined as the density integrated over the height of the disk. Um, this was a model developed by Lyndon Bell and Pringle. It's a really interesting paper, and I encourage you to read it if you haven't, because I find it really interesting. But there's another good derivation of this that comes straight from Navier-Stokes. So you can get this from the fluid equations. And it's just telling you how the surface density evolves with time and radius. Uh, now, because it is a second-order PDE, you need two boundary conditions, and this was something that we struggled with because it wasn't really clear which boundary conditions were appropriate. Um, we ended up going with just sort of zero surface density at some fixed radius and zero surface density out at infinity. But your results actually do depend a lot on which uh, boundary conditions you choose. So that's just a warning if you want to try and solve this at some point. But what I want you to take away from this equation is, uh, see that new right there, that little V thing? Um, yeah, funny story. <laughs> That's the viscosity, and it depends on temperature. So temperature is the, probably the most complicated problem we solved with this because it is circularly connected with the surface density. So, um, but it's, it's, not a, it's not something you can write down. It's not analytic. So the dust temperature, through coupling with gas, determines the gas temperature. Gas temperature goes in the viscosity, which determines the surface density of that equation I just showed you. But then because of the uh, surface density increasing, you have an optical depth effect. And then you uh, will increase your dust temperature again. And now you have to go back and solve the thing all over again. So how do we break this cycle? So to do this, I am assuming this temperature function, 
which looks really complicated, but it is basically something that was flexible enough to actually capture what was happening and simple enough that you know you can take analytic derivatives of this uh, in the code. So uh, we assume this flexible form, and we use a code called RADMC3D. It's a Monte Carlo radiative transport code, and uh, fit every every time step and all the radii, and it eventually actually converges, which was a little bit surprising, but uh, this will actually converge, and um, then you can just throw this temperature into the viscosity, and everything is determined. Once the surface density is known, the rest is actually relatively easy. Um, we saw for the velocity of a small gas parcel as it moves toward the star, and then integrate to find the path that it takes. So that's what I'm showing in this top left panel, is just sort of um, radius as a function of time as this parcel moves in toward the star. Um, all the tracks are color coded, so you can follow them in the other panels. And this is just showing you how its local environment is changing as it spirals in. And this turns out to be really important for disk chemistry because, I mean, for example, the cosmic ray rate along the 5AU track is falling off really rapidly. So cosmic ray driven chemistry won't be able to happen at 0.6 million years, whereas it was more likely at uh, zero. So these are the kinds of effects that we have to take into account when we're solving this. So I'm just going to flash up this panel um, of results, and I don't want you to be too nervous. There are a lot of points. But um, in our study, we found that accretion is really important. And I'm showing here, uh, as a function of relative abundance in a dynamic model, the enhancement or depletion. Uh, enhancement is above this dashed line, and the depletion is below, uh, compared to a model that had no accretion. So um, we basically fix the gas parcel at its final position and run the chemistry for a million years and ask, what does that gas parcel look like? And you can see that it's extremely different. Uh, I would draw your attention to the fact that this is on a log scale. So we're seeing enhancements of you know, up to almost 10 to the 6 uh, enhancement. And uh, some of the interesting species that we point out in the paper are labeled. Um, so you see uh, all the points with a, a border, uh, a sort of pink border. Those are hydrocarbons. And so we thought that was sort of an interesting group to bring to people's attention because, you know, everybody loves hydrocarbons. And um, we are obviously looking at about 1 AU. That's, you know, sort of Earth-like uh, planet-forming zone. So just what kind of environment would this planet be able to form in? What, what kind of chemistry would it see? So now you should be asking, well, why does that happen? Why, why does accretion make such a big difference? And it turns out that cosmic rays are largely to blame. So cosmic rays play a huge role in this simulation, and the cosmic ray-driven chemistry can only happen rapidly in the outer disk because that's where the surface density is low. But chemistry tends to follow where the densities are high and the temperature is high. So what you're having when, when you have accretion in your disk, what's happening is that cosmic ray flux in the outer disk is enabling chemistry that can't happen in the inner disk, and then things spiral in, and then you get a different composition in the inner disk than you would in the outer. Uh, so just a few takeaways for you. Um, accretion really changes the composition along streams of material in the disk, particularly uh, potentially changing the co compositions of planets that form there. So it's really important to take accretion into account in any disk simulation. Um, now, obviously, I haven't taken all the effects into account, so maybe there's an effect that counters accretion. I don't know. But um, just in general, if you are simulating a disk, accretion is something to keep in mind. Uh, signs of accretion, like enhanced hydrocarbons, like I showed in the last plot, uh, might be observable with JWST, JWST, but only if vertical mixing is strong and sort of lofts midplane material into the uh, upper disk layers, because we aren't really able to probe the disk midplane, uh, which is where all these simulations were confined. So if there is a lot of vertical mixing, then maybe you can see this somehow uh, and know that there is high accretion or low accretion. And uh, some of those effects that I mentioned that I'm not taking into account will be taken into account in my next project, so stay tuned. And uh, thank you.
second is if there is a planet, of course, it, it clears out, uh, it could push the gas out or... Yes. And, and, and that would change dramatically. The so perhaps that's another way of finding planets. That may be your next project. Um, maybe, <laughs> but uh, you're you're absolutely right. There, we've sort of approximated away any kind of um, azimuthal structure, and we aren't taking we are taking you know a smooth surface density profile, which isn't completely realistic. So you're absolutely right. Um, those are probably effects that do come into play, but you know you have to you have to cut off your approximations somewhere. So. Uh, accretion rate is actually variable in our model. Uh, so we are um, not using the steady Linden Bell and Pringle equation, which does fix accretion rate. We're using the unsteady version. So we're actually able to c compute which accretion rate we get at every time. Um, and I don't remember the number, but. Um, okay, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, are you asking which viscosity function we chose, or? You mentioned that viscosity is a function of density and temperature. Yes. In principle, it's also magnetic field. Well, yes. But then, but then how do you, what's the physics behind it? Because it depends on the tuberance. Um, yes, so we are using the alpha disk viscosity, which means that we have sort of uh, encapsulated all of that into just the one alpha parameter. Um, we are choosing a pretty low alpha parameter compared to some other studies, but uh, observations actually support that, uh, that there's low turbulence and so a low alpha value. affects the material that's available to make planets is something that would really be fascinating to them. Okay. So we'd have to talk ahead of time because obviously you'd have to do more than 10 minutes and I would have to set it up so that they were prepared for it. But I think that's incredibly important stuff and I think they would enjoy it. Are you okay? You're asking to be watering a bit. No, I have a, it's a nervous habit. Oh, okay. I'm fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, my husband just had cataract surgery this weekend, so he has that. So I'm looking at that. Well, that's, you know, well, I want to thank you. Nobody thinks of that. People try to fit as much stuff as they can. Yeah. And this was very effective. Thank you. You know, great. We definitely have to do more of this. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think it's pretty similar that it doesn't look at all like it does. No, but it has like a shape of it. When you sign on the small one, like you can see it totally. Yeah. Like it's really hard enough. But at the same time, it's still like, you don't know. It was great. Yeah. 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 Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god.